Hello, everybody. Welcome to another video for History Vibe podcast. Today, I'm, I'm doing my first in-person interview with Professor John Copperboard. It's good to meet you in person, John. You too, finally. Yeah. Yeah, let's, let's do it. So how do we know, how do scholars know that Mark is the first gospel? Um, well, I, I'd first say that we, you have to distinguish between relative dating and absolute dating. On relative dating, uh, the what one does is compare Mark with the with two documents to which it's uh, clearly uh, literarily related. Luke, uh, in which we do this is first by uh, identifying the similarities that the three Gospels uh, share, uh, and then identifying the the differences. Um, and the different the I think the salient differences here. Uh, have to do with uh, aspects of grammar, whose grammar is better, uh, mm-hmm. uh, who makes which which uh, gospel has um, uh, better connections uh, between sentences, between episodes, which uh, uh, which uh, uh, gospel contains elements that would have posed difficulties for the readers, and which of them. Uh, seems to have eliminated those difficulties. So those are the kinds of issues that one looks for. And uh, so one, when, when one compares uh, Mark with either Matthew or Luke, the first thing that one notices is uh, how much better the grammar of Matthew and Luke are. Um, uh, there's a characteristic of uh, Greek writing, um, Poor Greek writing, where independent clauses are simply uh, connected with the with the word "and," it's not mm. good in English, and it's certainly and it's even worse in in Greek when one does that. Uh, Mark has a much higher incidence of connecting independent clauses with uh, with "kai" or "and," um, and both Matthew and Luke uh, show a tendency to eliminate that kind of paratactic construction and substitute proper subordination of clauses. And that is, they create longer sentences, but they also create sentences that have multiple uh, subordinate clauses mm-hmm. in them rather than, than Jesus said this, and this happened, and this happened. So when faced with that phenomenon, uh, the uh, I think the likeliest conclusion is that Mark is the earlier gospel, and Matthew and Luke have both uh, improved its grammar. There is also a matter of the uh, presence of additional materials in Matthew and Luke. For example, both Matthew and Luke have uh, pretty extensive birth stories uh, about Jesus, and both of them have extensive appearance stories. Uh, one of the cu- peculiar things about Mark is perhaps not that it lacks a birth story, but that uh, in Mark's gospel, while Jesus several times predicts his own resurrection, it doesn't actually occur. That is, Mark ends curiously with the uh, discovery of the empty tomb and the women running away and telling nothing to anybody for they were afraid. Very peculiar ending. Whereas both Matthew and Luke uh, continue their stories with a number of apparent stories. They're actually different apparent stories, but they, um, from a narrative point of view, they uh, they fulfill the prediction that that Jesus repeatedly makes about his. Um, uh, about his resurrection. So, uh, it, you know, if one asks the question, which of those three Gospels is likely to be the earliest, it's surely Mark, and the other two have responded to what they see as a kind of narrative deficiency in the Gospel by adding uh, extra materials, both uh, birth stories and uh, resurrection stories. Um, and third, there's also uh, there's also features of Mark that that contain pretty clear, clear errors. Uh, one of the most obvious uh, one is uh, in Mark's uh, story of plucking grain on the Sabbath, where he has Jesus say, don't you remember uh, how David's men uh, entered the temple and ate the, uh, the bread, uh, the show bread, which was not uh, permitted to, uh, to eat when Abiathar was the high priest? Well, as a matter of fact, Abiathar wasn't the high priest at that point. Um, it was Ahimelech, 
Uh, and both Mark, both Matthew and Luke seem to have uh, spotted the fact that you've got a historical error there, and they've simply eliminated that. There's a number of other places where uh, one can compare Mark's formulation with the formulations that you have in Matthew and Luke. And it's not perhaps so much an error as it is um, uh, el eliminating features of Mark that would likely present themselves as offensive to, or problematic at least, for the reader. Uh, one of the notorious ones is Mark 3, 20 to 21, where he tells the story that uh, Jesus' family uh, uh, in, tried to intervene and seize him because they were saying he was crazy. Now, both Matthew and Luke have eliminated that story uh, for pretty obvious reasons, because both Matthew and Luke, in their infancy stories at least, feature uh, uh, G members of Jesus' family, Joseph in, uh, in Matthew's gospel and Mary in Luke's gospel, as uh, being aware of who Jesus was, because in both cases, angels have told them. Uh, so that story in Mark of his family thinking that he's crazy and wanting to uh, interdict him mm -hmm. uh, is narratively problematic because both Matthew and Luke have already told you that uh, members of Matthew's fa of Jesus' family are already uh, kind of on side with him. Mm -hmm. uh, so that, that kind of thing gets eliminated. Another uh, uh, technical error that Mark makes is in the introduction to his gospel where he begins in Mark uh, 1, 2, saying, um, uh, as was written in uh, Isaiah, um, uh, uh, no, I'm sorry, that, that's a text critical problem. Mm -hmm. um, but there's, uh, there's uh, a number of places where it, they, Matthew and Luke both seem to have uh, smoothed out what they would perceive as difficulties for the reader of Mark's gospel. And, uh, and either eliminated diff uh, difficult parts, or uh, that they have um, uh, substituted other kinds of uh, 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 vocabulary. For example, in uh, in Mark six, where Jesus returns to his hometown uh, and doesn't get uh, an enthusiastic reception, uh, Mark uh, says that he could not do any miracles because. Uh, uh, because of their, uh, uh, he could not do any any powerful miracles there, um, and, and he marveled at their unbelief. Now Matthew changes this; he did not do any miracles because of their unbelief. And you can see what he's what he's reacting to. It's not for Matthew that Jesus is unable to do miracles; he's un he will not do miracles because he he responds to uh, the faithfulness or the faith of. Uh, suppliants, and if he doesn't find it there, there's no miracle. So he's uh, he's giving, uh, I think, a theologically more uh, appealing explanation of why Jesus doesn't have to do any miracles in in uh, in Nazareth. So when one puts together all of those features: improvement of grammar, elimination of mistakes, um, uh, elimination of uh, potentially problematic formulations uh, by both Matthew and Luke it seems then uh, a reasonable conclusion that Mark is first and the other two in editing Mark have variously uh, responded to those difficulties in the text and have, and have uh, eliminated them or, or reworded them or something like that. Uh, and that really, the Mark and priority is pretty much the dominant view of uh, most uh, New Testament scholars these days. There are still a very few um, that think that Mark is uh, posterior to both Matthew and Luke. Um, uh, but that then presents the challenge of explaining why Mark would have introduced rougher grammar, poorer grammar, uh, when, they're, when Mark would be looking at Matthew and Luke, who have, relatively speaking, better grammar and don't have the kinds of errors and um, rough spots in, the, in their gospels that Mark then has. So that I think you can see why the strong preference is to think that Mark is first uh, and Matthew and Luke have edited Mark, uh, eliminating, improving, uh, eliminating errors and, and so forth. Um, it's a more difficult matter to then establish an absolute date for Mark. Um, and 
I would say the consensus is that it's sometime around the fall of Jerusalem, uh, a few years before, um, say from 66 onward, or a little bit after, so from 70 to 73 or 74. Um, and uh, that also fits with, uh, uh, with data that we've got from Matthew uh, and Luke. Both Matthew and Luke very clearly understand that Jerusalem has been, uh, has been devastated and attacked. Uh, uh, Matthew's treatment of the parable of the Great Supper uh, which isn't in Mark at all, it's added to Mark, uh, probably from Q, uh, uh, makes it pretty clear that Matthew is interpreting that parable in the light of the, of the destruction of Jerusalem. And uh, Luke, likewise, when he edits Mark's um, apocalyptic account, where Mark says, when you, you, know, when, uh, you see the, the, um, uh, uh, the abomination standing where it ought not to, then everybody in Judea should uh, flee to the hills. Luke changes that in, into when you see Jerusalem ringed by armies, mm -hmm. then you know that its um, uh, devastation is near. Uh, and Luke here is, I think, betraying historical knowledge of the fact that when uh, Titus and, and his legions attacked uh, Jerusalem, they did what they did uh, what Roman armies typically did in besieging a city, they established a ring around the city. It's called a circumvallation wall. The, and parts of the circumvallation wall are still uh, still visible. They're much clearer when you get to Masada, whereas you look down, you can actually see the circumvallation wall. So when Luke says, you, when you see Jerusalem ringed by armies, then you know that its fall is near. It, he is he is reflecting what he knows to have happened. Uh, and that would that certainly would put both Matthew and Luke probably well after the destruction of Jerusalem. Uh, Mark sometime just around the, the destruction of Jerusalem, I think. When it comes to Matthew and Luke, they both use Mark, but the consensus is that Matthew and Luke did not know each other. Yes. I know some question I say, well, maybe Matthew knew Luke or Luke knew Matthew. Um, and but in any, in any case, Matthew and Luke have material in common. It's very similar, somewhat different too, depending mm, yeah. on what we're talking about. And they're getting it, they're not getting it from Mark, they're getting it from another source. And, and scholars like yourself believe in the Q source. Can you tell us a bit about that? Yeah, so this is the, the positing of Q source comes, yeah. uh, it's a corollary of first Mark and priority that, that Mark is prior to both Matthew and Luke. Uh, and then, a corollary of the fact that Matthew and Luke share a good deal of material, about 4,000 words, that they clearly didn't get from Mark because it's not in Mark at all. Um, and that's the material that uh, sort of neutrally could be called the double tradition. The, uh, the stuff that they share with Mark, we call the triple tradition. Um, uh, but they've got this double tradition from somewhere. And that's the point at which uh, the two-document hypothesis departs from the far hypothesis. So on the two-document hypothesis, Matthew and Luke have independently used this second source that we now call Q, uh, editing it in different ways and positioning it relative to Mark in different, in different uh, places. Whereas the far hypothesis takes the view that uh, Luke has taken that double tradition from, uh, from Matthew um, and uh, repositioned it relative to uh, Mark's framework. Uh, uh, now, both of the, I'd say neither of these hypotheses is a kind of slam dunk because with any hypothesis, there's always a bit of counter data that you have to, uh, you have to explain away. Uh, I mean, it happens in modern physics too, where you've got all sorts of counter observations in modern physics that, one has to, a theory has to adapt to. Mm -hmm. um, but that's what, uh, so th that's sort of the, the general state of synoptic studies right now, the, kind of the uh, a debate between two document hypotheses and the far hypothesis. Um, I'd say on the two document hypothesis, the, uh, as I said, the, the, the theory is that Matthew and Luke have independently edited Mark and have independently 
uh, edited or added Q uh, to Mark. Uh, one of the reasons for thinking that they have they have dealt with their sources independently of one another uh, is that if you look at Matthew's editing of Mark and Luke's ed and Luke's editing of Mark, they edit Mark in different ways. Mm -hmm. um, uh, so they both of them will tend to make grammar smoother, but they make it smoother in different ways. Both of, both, uh, both of them have eliminated errors, but they often em eliminate them in different ways. Uh, and they've, uh, both of them supplement material. So, uh, you know, I think as everyone knows, both Matthew and Luke have infancy stories, but they're different infancy stories. And both of them have resurrection appearance stories, but they're different uh, resurrection appearance stories. Um, and uh, when it comes to the double tradition material, the, the so-called Q material, Matthew and Luke have integrated the Q material into their gospels relative to Mark in different ways. Uh, the, the way that I sort of illustrate this to my undergraduate students is to say, if you all had a, uh, a biography of uh, Socrates, and if you also had a collection of sayings of Socrates, and I asked you uh, to take those two and put them together into a meaningful narrative, I would end up with 30 different accounts because uh, those students would have made different editorial position, uh, decisions about where you stick a saying of Socrates uh, relative to the biography of Socrates. Uh, and if I, had, if I saw three or four of them uh, coming up with exactly the same editorial decisions, I would say you've worked together because uh, one, one of your, some of your decisions have affected uh, other of your, your fellow students in, in deciding how to, how to combine these sayings. And that's essentially the, the situation that we have with Matthew and Luke, that they have the same uh, kind of source material, a narrative, largely narrative, narrative source from Mark, and a largely saying source uh, from somewhere else. And they've made different editorial decisions about how you connect uh, the sayings of Jesus to the Markan framework. Now, um, the the point at which they do agree for a little while is has to do with the sayings of John the Baptist, the, the the description of John the Baptist in Mark, and the sayings of John the Baptist at the beginning of Q, uh, and the temptation story. Uh, but there's really no other place that Matthew and Luke could have put those, uh, put, could have actually attached those sayings. I mean, it doesn't make any, it wouldn't make any sense to have sayings of John the Baptist at the beginning and then somewhere in the middle of, of Matthew or in the middle, middle of Luke. And similarly, the temptation story uh, fits better. Uh, the, their longer temptation story fits better where Mark has his temptation story. Mm -hmm. So they've used that Mark's Tuver's tem sto temptation story is a kind of peg to stick in the much longer Q temptation story. But after that point, Matthew and Luke disagree completely in the way in which they've integrated the sayings material into the Mark and framework. And as I say, that's exactly what you would expect if they were working independently. Uh, and if they weren't indep working independently, you would actually expect collaboration. You'd see Matthew and Luke making the same editorial decisions about how to connect the Q material to the Markin material. And in fact, they don't do that. Um, so that's, that's one set of observations that, that uh, makes uh, defenders of the two document hypothesis think that they really, that, that Q is, an, is a source that has been independently utilized by Matthew and Luke rather than the FAR hypothesis uh, where uh, Luke has taken all that double uh, material from from Mark uh, from uh, from Matthew and then redeployed it relative to its Mark and framework. So that's a, in my view, that's a, a more difficult editorial procedure to imagine. Um, uh, I would say though, at you know, at the end of the day, we're working with hypothetical scenarios. That is, we what would be really nice is to have. Uh, an original copy of Matthew with marginal notes saying "stick Q here," or, you know, <laughs> or you know, change the order. You know, we're we're never going to have those kinds of data. Um, 
So uh, what we're with synoptic problem hypotheses, we're really um, working with hypotheses that appear to make best sense of the data that we've got most of the time. And there's always going to be a there's always going to be a bit of counter data that uh, that shows up that that probably tells us the reality of the matter was probably more complicated than we can ever get to. Uh, um, uh, but you you know you work with what hypothesis makes the most sense most of the time. Okay. So it seems like one way or the other, it's clear. If there's anything that can be known, is it's, it's clear that copying is taking place because we have oh yeah absolutely three passion we have the three passion narratives of Mark Matthew and Luke that look very much alike, forming a triple agreement. That's right, and we've got you know we've got uh, if you if you use a synopsis like Alan's synopsis or even Throckmorton's synopsis and just start underlining verbatim agreements between Matthew, Mark, and Luke, you'll see that there are places where there's. 95% agreement uh, between Matthew and Luke or between Matthew and Mark uh, uh, in longish passages. And that is really only explicable uh, on a hypothesis that somebody is copying somebody else. Uh, if this was dependent on oral transmission, you're going to expect a lot more variation uh, than, than in fact you find. Is it known at all how Mark made the mistake of, of saying Abathar was the high priest? Where did he get that idea from? Yeah, it's a good question. I don't know if it's answerable. Uh, mm -hmm. He just says that he, uh, um, uh, I don't think, uh, I don't think Mark is terribly well informed on things Jewish. Uh, I mean, he makes a couple of er errors in describing what all Jews do. He says they all wash uh, their hands before they, uh, before they eat. Pharisees probably do, but to say all Jews is something of an exaggeration uh, or even an error. Um, so, uh, I, you know, this actually then has some Im Im impact on where you think Mark is written. If Mark were written in uh, Jewish Palestine, one would, I think, expect a higher degree of knowledge, what I would call local knowledge, uh, than he seems to than he seems to reflect. Uh, if he's written somewhere else, even in Syria, or some people think in Rome, then there's going to be more of a disconnect in, in, in what he knows about Jewish traditions, about Jewish literature. Uh, so it may be that uh, he's heard the name Abiathar and mm -hmm. he figures, well, it's a good enough name. Uh, or maybe he's using a source that has the same error. I don't know. But it is, it's interesting that Matthew spots this and it's gone. Uh, I think Matthew displays a good deal more local knowledge of Judaism wherever it is that he's written. Uh, some think in Antioch, um, Andy Overman and a couple of others think Sepphoris, which would put him right in the, you know, right in the middle of the Galilee, which might account for a somewhat higher degree of local knowledge of Jews and Judaism. Was the Q source written in layers? I know that some scholars, like the late Burton Mack, thought that it was written in redactional layers. Or do you think it was written all at once in one cohesive text? I think uh, I'm one of the people who thinks that there's some layers involved in Q. Um, uh, and uh, my stuff on Q and Bert's stuff on Q came out just about at the same time when we were collaborators in some remote sense, at least. Um, the uh, the the challenge that Q presents is that it has uh, it has material that uh, seems sort of straightforwardly didactic, that is, um, and and conforms to uh, an ancient literary genre called an instruction, which which typically begin with kind of programmatic sayings, "Blessed are the poor" or something like that. And then move to uh, admonitions in the second person plural, and then finish with a peroration. If you look at this, the way the Sermon on the Plain or Sermon on the Mount is constructed, that's exactly how it's constructed. So you begin with some third person declarations um, that sort of set the stage, and then a series of uh, do this, don't do that. And then the sermon then ends with this uh, visualization of the 
of the bill of the person who builds their house either on sand or on on rock and what happens if you don't listen to my words um, and there's uh, there's about five blocks in queue that correspond really nicely to that uh, that instructional genre but tucked between them are different kinds of material uh, material that is openly hostile towards what Q calls this generation. Um, and uh, that's also where you see threats of judgment appearing and, uh, and so forth. And uh, so, uh, and then you have the, the um, temptation story, which, is a, which seems like it's a, bit, a little bit of an outlier. Uh, so one of the challenges that has that Q uh, that scholars of Q have faced is how one understands this kind of heterogeneity, literary heterogeneity, uh, in uh, uh, in the contents of Q, uh, and kind of abrupt transitions from this didactic mode to this polemical mode, and then all of a sudden you're back to a didactic mode and so forth. So uh, uh, some. Uh, scholars are content to say, "Well, that's just the way it was written." It, you know, it flips back and forth between uh, between one kind of discursive mode where you're addressing insiders essentially, and then other points where you're you're really taking it, theoretically or imaginatively you're taking it aim aim at, at hostile outsiders, and moving back and forth. That, I I guess you can find literary analogies for that, but you can also find literary analogies for uh, uh, documents that are purely didactic, and at least the proposal that I made in my doctoral thesis, which was published in 1987, was that one could uh, imagine the growth of Q from a kind of core of these didactic sayings, and at a certain point in a Q's usage uh, by the, those who wrote it and those who, who uh, used it. Um, they also realized that 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 they had to make um, a case both for the authority of Jesus and to go after their opponents, and so um, material was stuck in the middle of these didactic sayings that made that polemical point, uh, taking aim at this generation, um, threatening them for their non-acceptance of uh, the Q people. Uh, or Q's message, at least. So we have sayings like, woe to you, uh, Chorazin, wo woe to you, Bethsaida, woe to you, um, uh, Capernaum, uh, be, you know, because you paid no attention to this wonder, the signs that were done there, and it will go better for Sodom and Gomorrah in those days than it will for you. It'll go better for Tyre and Sidon, Gentile cities. It will go better for them than it is for you. So there, Q is mobilizing uh, prophetic discourse that you see in Ezekiel and, and texts like that, uh, rather than the discursive habits that you see in Proverbs 1 to 9 um, uh, and other parts of the Hebrew Bible and other kinds of Near Eastern literature, which is, which is didactic. So that kind of model made, a bit, made more sense to me that you've got two different phases or two different layers of the development of Q's discourse, one that is Community directed and didactic, and one of it, and the second, which is defensive and polemical, uh, uh, trying to create a kind of imaginative space for Q and its people in the face of opposition and in the face of uh, criticism. Now, uh, as I said, in respect to the synoptic problem issues, too, these are hypotheses, right? And you, these are ways of conceptualizing complicated data sets that we've got. And uh, the hypothesis tries to present a, a, a kind of narrative scenario of how things develop. And uh, that turns that, you know, two or three layers of Q model has gained a certain kind of traction. Um, uh, uh, but there's certainly, there's certainly colleagues who say, no, I, we can imagine Q being constructed in a kind of single moment containing both of these um, discursive. Uh, models simultaneously. So, um, I, I happen to think it, it, it works better if you imagine Q as an evolving collection um, in a couple of different phases rather than a single moment. But uh, 
as I say, these are all hypotheses that that work, sort of. <laughs> when you look at the the double tradition material in Matthew and Luke, do you think they're modifying, editing, incorporating data from the same version of Q, or is it something oh, like one well, of your yeah. di diagrams in the in your in your book that's yeah. in Q about oh, okay? Q, Matthew's getting it from Q Matthew and Luke's getting it from Q Luke. Yeah, that's a really great, that's a great question. Um, and uh, uh, the, uh, I, I guess it, it's um, <clears throat> Ulrich Lutz uh, in Germany or in Switzerland actually, uh, who <clears throat> made a case for multiple versions of Q. And the reason that he did that is that when you say, when you look at, uh, Matthew's version of the Q text and Luke's version of the Q text. There's variation, um, and uh, so if you, if it were the case that all of the Mathean elements that are different from the Lucan elements are demonstratively Mathean editorial tendencies, uh, and all of the Lucan departures are uh, clearly Lucan editorial tendencies, you could say. They're working with a, a single common text, and they're simply editing Q uh, in the in the way in which they typically edit Mark. The problem is that isn't the case. Uh, there's a number of there's a number of places where you could make that argument. For example, Matthew likes calling the kingdom the kingdom of the heavens, uh, and the fact that his beatitude, "Blessed are the poor, for theirs is the kingdom of the heavens." Uh, you could say, well, he's actually starting with kingdom of God, as as Luke has, and he's simply substituting his favorite favorite phrase. But there are enough uh, there are enough points where the differences can't easily be explained by mm -hmm. recourse to Matthew's editorial tendencies or Luke's. And so uh, Lutz suggested that maybe there's already a Q Matthew and mm -hmm. a Q Luke. Um, that uh, uh, that contained these edit these editorial peculiarities uh, or ed ed editorial differences, and Luke is simply taking over Q Luke, which already has some of these uh, linguistic features that are not necessarily his own hobby horse, and ditto with uh, with Luke, with uh, with Matthew. Um, in a way that actually then throws back the question onto how do you explain the editing, uh, the appearance of Q Matthew and Q Luke from Q. Um, uh, uh, so it, in, in a way it pushes the, pro the editorial problem back one layer, but if you don't worry too much about that, then this notion of two different versions of Q uh, uh, could work for you. Um, my own view is that, uh, uh, I, I think it's I think it's ex completely unlikely that Matthew and Luke are using the same manuscript of Q. Um, at the very least, they're using different copies of Q. You know, one that's one that exists wherever Matthew is written, let's say in Syria or in Antioch, and another that's written wherever Luke was written, say in the northeastern part of the Aegean uh, or Ephesus, maybe or something like that. So it just it's, 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 it seems to me completely unlikely that both of them have the same copy of Q that they're, that they're using. So at the very least, they're using different copies of whatever the original might be. And, you know, as we look at the uh, manuscripts of the New Testament, uh, it's, it's, it's very difficult to find any two manuscripts that are exactly the same. There's always differences um, because scribes, either improve the text or they make mistakes or whatever. Um, so at the very least, there's going to, be, there will be a Matthew, a, a Q Matthew and a Q Luke, just how different they are from the original. That's very difficult to say because, you know, we're already working at sort of two removes mm. from any documents that were any real documents that we have. Um, you know, we're working with uh, second or third century ma uh, uh, manuscripts of Matthew and Luke. So they're already a century or more away from the from the original, where there's, which means that there's already going to be some variations introduced there. So our reconstruction of Q is already beset by by problems of scribal transmission. 
And then to imagine that we go back a further layer uh, to think about how predecessors to Q, to Matthew, to Matthew's predecessor for uh, Q material and Luke's predecessor, you know, you know, you're starting to get so far away from any tangible evidence that we have that, um, uh, you know, it, it, it's, I think no one would ever go to the wall on, you know, on the wording of Q Matthew or Q Luke. I think the best that we can say is it's surely the case that Matthew and Luke are using different copies of Q and there's going to be variation between, inevitably there will be variation between Matthew and Luke's Q. But can we get it? Can we get to it? Can we actually know anything real? I don't think so. Unless um, manuscripts are turning up someday. Ah, uh, yeah, you know, you know. Uh, I, I, you know, I said to to people that you know when I was finishing my dissertation, I was really hoping that Q wouldn't show up as a manuscript, <laughs> unless I was absolutely right on everything. <laughs> but you know, that's just too, that's that's too good to wish for, <laughs> and it hasn't shown up, of course. But. When do you think that this Q text was m most like circa when it was started to be written down and when did it finish? Yeah, good. That's a good question too. Uh, I think it's uh, well. Uh, it has to have been written before Matthew and Luke were written because uh, they're right. using it. Right. Uh, but that's not you know that's not terribly helpful. That means it's somewhere in the first century. Uh, one of the the kind of marks that that scholars look for is when they look at any document is does the not does the document know about certain historical facts his, historical happenings and the obvious one is the destruction of jerusalem so the question with q is does it know about the destruction of jerusalem and there the jury is still a bit out here um, q has this interesting saying this is uh the q saying that lies behind uh, Luke 13:34-35. Uh, uh, it's the statement about Jerusalem, and it says, "Your house is Arimos, that your house is abandoned or empty or vacant." Um, now, yeah. does that is that actually is that a reflection on the fact that the, that the sanctuary has been destroyed by Titus? That would be one way of understanding Arimos, uh, empty or uh, deserted. Uh, or is this a kind of prophetic saying that declares in advance of the destruction of the temple that in Q's view, uh, the temple is non-operative as a real temple? Uh, uh, and that's certainly imaginative. Uh, 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 that's certainly an imaginable uh, scenario. And we have something of an analogy uh, reported by Josephus in War, uh, where he reports that there was a uh, just prior to, to the attack on Jerusalem by Titus's force, there was a character who was wandering around Jerusalem saying, you know, woe to this temple and so forth, um, uh, uh, seemingly predicting its destruction. Now, uh, a Roman missile hits him and kills him. Uh, and uh, Josephus sort of reports this with a certain amount of irony or humor that... Uh, He's the first person to suffer from his own prophecy. Um, but in any case, Josephus says that he's active in saying these things prior to uh, the destruction of the temple. So that, that would potentially mean that Q, that 1334 saying, could have been said prior to the destruction of the temple as a kind of criticism of the temple, or it could have been said after the temple's destruction. Um, uh, but I would think, uh, at the very least, it's Q. The final stage of Q comes from a point right around uh, the seventy plus or minus a, a couple of years. Uh, how early Q starts is is a different question because, especially if there's there's a couple of layers to Q, that means it's being it's being composed and supplemented over some period of time. But as far as I can tell, we have no way of uh, of saying how long, 10 years, 15 years, four years. Uh, at some, all you can say is that relatively speaking, that didactic material might be earlier than the polemical material in which that 1334 to 35 a passage uh, uh, exists. Um, 
And, uh, you know, so I'm a little bit skeptical uh, when you run into comments that, you know, Q was written in the year, you know, in the 40s or something like that. How would we know that? Uh, there's, there's just no pegs to hang your dating on. Mm. Um, if there, if there were a historical reference, um, say to uh, Caligula's uh, threat to install a, you know, a uh, a statue in the temple, then you'd say, ah, oh, yeah, it's sometime after forty one. But in the Q in that Q material, there's nothing like that where you can really hang your, uh, you know, hang a text on a partic uh, particular date. Do you think that Mark? Could have known one of the versions of Q, and maybe that could explain why he has a, a small amount of material from the double tradition, like the Beelzebul Brickaby. Yes, yeah. Uh, Beelzebul, the uh, uh, description of John the Baptist, uh, the, the parable of the mustard seed, um, the request for a sign. There's these really interesting, what are called Mark Q overlaps, uh, where Mark and Q seem to touch on the same story. Uh, typically, the Q version is longer and contains a lot more speech material. But this, the possibility that you raise is one that's a live possibility. And uh, uh, there's a number of good scholars who think that math, that uh, Mark knew Q, and that's, that's how to explain those Mark Q overlaps. Mark has actually got some of those passages, uh, those ideas out of Q. Uh, and if that's the case, then... Mark would have to have edited down a longer Q version of, uh, say, John the Baptist's uh, proclamations of, uh, of repentance, eliminating the 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 uh, words of John the Baptist that that both that, that Q has, uh, and he uh, would have seen, uh, say, the parable of the mustard seed and the parable of the leaven, but only taken the mustard seed. So uh, you. Uh, that 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 view of uh, of Q's relationship to to Mark then require requires you to see Mark as editing down parts of Q. There's nothing impossible about that. You know, we know of other ancient authors that that um, prepared what are called uh, epitomes or epitomes of of longer documents that they had, basically cutting out stuff that they. Uh, that they didn't find useful to produce a much smaller and more compact kind of gospel uh, or document. Uh, that's possible. Um, uh, and really, the the decision between Mark and Q is independent and, and the view that uh, Mark is dependent upon Q in some sense or knows of Q in some sense really comes down to uh, how plausible you can make a scenario of Mark knowing some bits of Q that are typically longer and cutting them down in size. And that's a really hard decision to make, um, uh, which is more plausible. Um, uh, on one hand, when you look at, when Mark tells miracle stories, he likes lots of detail. Uh, he, in fact, uh, produces much longer miracle stories uh, then both Matthew and Luke, again, if you look at a synopsis, you'll see that sometimes Matthew's version of a miracle story is only a third the length of, Mar of Mark's version, um, which would suggest that either, that e at least that Mark is loquacious. He likes, he likes to talk a lot. Mm -hmm. And that might pose a, a problem for the notion that he's got a source that is always, almost always longer than, than what he ends up with. That seems to go against his own tendency to produce long and detailed uh, narrative uh, material. On the other hand, you can say he likes telling long stories, but when it comes to sayings, he can get away with shortened versions of them. You know, this is, I think this is an unresolvable problem. Um, uh, and there are uh, appealing aspects of both the independence theory and the theory that that uh, Mark knows Q uh, and has adapted um, uh, Q's sayings uh, in some way or another. Uh, uh, my colleague Bill Arnell, William Arnell, has has wondered whether um, 
uh, for example, this Q saying about your temple being uh, Eremos, being va vacated or deserted, has not been transformed into Mark as uh, Jesus' statement at the beginning of chapter 13, saying to the disciples, I tell you, not one stone will be, will be standing on another. Um, so uh, you could at least imagine a scenario where Mark has seen this Q saying about the temple being abandoned and actually turned it into a narrative, uh, a little conversation between Jesus and the disciples, uh, which ends with this powerful statement that one stone will not be left standing on the other. And, you know, this is a remarkable saying. I, I think you have seen the, the, the stones in the lower course of what exists at the temple now. To say that not one stone will be left standing on another is really something when you realize these stones are a meter tall and some of them are three or four meters long and as probably as deep. You know, that's an amazing statement to make. But uh, you could, you might imagine the, 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 that, that Mark has turned Q's um, rather um, uh, laconic statement that the temple is Eremos into this much more dramatic narrative of not one stone uh, left on another. That, that's, but you know, we're into, there you're into the, the uh, kind of a, a process of imagining Mark's creativity. Um, and, uh, uh, but there's almost no way to test that. Uh, if you kind of posit a terribly creative Mark, then that scenario of him using bits and pieces of cue and turning them into something else. Uh, might work if you think of Mark as a rather clunky editor who only who only takes over what he's got. Mm -hmm. Then it's much harder to make that kind of scenario uh, work. But so much of it depends on us imagining what Mark is actually doing and what he can do. When it comes to the infancy narratives in Matthew and Luke that are quasi similar but also a bit different from one another, do you think they? Uh, could have gotten that uh, some of that information that they do kind of agree on, sort of from a infancy source, a common some, source, yeah. Or is it possible that maybe Q had that? Yeah, that hasn't been mooted very often. That that Q had anything like this. There was long, long time ago. There was some suggestion that there there might be. But if you actually look at what Matthew and Luke agree on in the infancy stories, it's not very much. Mm -hmm. uh, it basically he was born in Bethlehem. Uh, uh, the details of the birth are completely different. Uh, the details of the lead up to the birth are completely different. So in, you know, in Luke, it's Mary who's featured as the one who is told. Uh, and uh, uh, for Luke, Jesus' family doesn't, they don't live in Bethlehem. They live in, in Nazareth and therefore they have to come down uh, to Nazareth for the birth to happen. Whereas uh, Luke, it's, it's, Joseph, who is featured as the reception, the recipient of Revelation, uh, and they, the family lives in Bethlehem. That's why he was born there, and he's they live in a house. You know, mm -hmm. Luke has it in a stable uh, or an inn or a, st a stable um, uh, because they're visitors, of course. Um, and Matthew has it in a house. So, as they say, apart from Jesus getting born and getting born in Bethlehem, at that point. There's almost nothing left uh, as far as agreements are concerned. So uh, if you if you wanted to posit a Q, you would it would be really hard to to decide what Q might have contained apart from Bethlehem. Uh, uh, you'd have to then uh, posit some other kind of uh, um, uh, some other kind of story from which Matthew and Luke derive. But doing it from a single word, I think, is it, that doesn't give you enough to start with. Um, it, I think it would be better to, to assume that Matthew and Luke, um, or whatever particular sources they are using, they start with the fact that he's born in Bethlehem because there's a connection with David. And then you get an imaginative uh, account of his birth uh, by two different kinds of writers, which then Matthew and Luke have, uh, have both uh, taken on board. I'd like to get into the weeds a bit about um, Mark and priority because I, uh, some scholars, and we've kind of talked about a little bit, a little bit of this in the previous interviews, that some scholars believe in a proto-Mark. I know that. Yeah. That was more common back then than it is today. But some scholars <laughs> believe in proto-Mark still even now mm -hmm. so, and, because they think 
Well, they say that Mark seems to embellish in certain places where his, per his pericopes are larger than Matthew and Luke's on the same information. And Matthew and Luke's stories often look more primitive than Mark in the triple tradition. And they'll say it's also kind of odd that Mark has kind of zigzags where he goes from total Matthewan agreement or alleged Matthew, total Matthewan agreement. And then here and there, he'll totally agree with Luke's wording, which makes it look like the Grisback ends would say yeah. that yeah. looks like Mark is using Matthew and Luke. Or the people that think it's totally independent, like you know, I think like Icorn fought or M, the late Emmy Poison Mart and Philippe Roland is okay, Mark is not using Matthew and Luke and they're not using him. What's really going on is he's using sources, their sources, and he's conflating them, leaving out stuff kind of apologetically, I guess, when that doesn't fit, that, that, that he can't harmonize. What do you think about all that? Yeah, that's why well, I teach a course on synoptic problem every couple of years, and we start by looking at Griesbach, because in, uh, Griesbach is the, is the first in 1776 to, uh, uh, to come up with what appears to be a kind of coherent theory mm -hmm. of of origins, and his will put Mark at the end, uh, because of this, what he sees as a zigzag effect. That is that that um, he sees the agreements. If you look at sequential agreements and other kinds of agreements between Matthew and Mark on one hand, and Mark and Luke on the other hand, it seems that uh, that Mark follows or or at least agrees with Matthean's sequence for a while. And then at a certain point, he seems to flip over to Lucan sequence and then back. Mm -hmm. So this is this famous kind of zigzag thing. Uh, now, the, there's, uh, there's two kinds of questions to be raised there. Uh, whether that there actually is a zigzag effect, that it, and, and that has to do with how you arrange a synopsis. Mm -hmm. um, and, uh, uh, and how much you're prepared to um, uh, uh, put it this way. There are some places where Mark is in agreement with both, but what Griesbach's hypothesis sort of requires you to say, well, he's really more in agreement with Luke here, even though there's complete agreement with Matthew. So the question is, is there actually a zigzag that's going on? I mean, if it were the case, it, and if you had two doc, if you had three documents, two long documents and one short document, and you could see consistently that there was a zigzag effect. I think you would have to end up with with um, uh, the posterior uh, positioning of that middle document, because it would it would be almost impossible to explain the data in any other way. But the, the so the first kind of problem is: is there a consistent zigzag effect? And if you start looking at a synopsis, what what Griesbeck thought he found uh, is at least debatable. Um, that is whether it is a consistent zigzag uh, or not. Um, the second issue is uh, really one of what we know about the way in which ancient authors who used sources, how they used sources. And the, one of the parts of the Griesbeck hypothesis, one of the components of the Griesbeck hypothesis is not only that there is uh, supposed zigzagging at the level of the pericope, that is at the paragraph level, but there's zigzagging at the level of the sentence. Um, that is where Mark presumably has looked at a sentence in Matthew and taken a few words from that and then the sentence from Luke. Now, if Mark had something like a synopsis where the two parallel texts that he could actually look at and pick and choose sometimes Matthew's formulation, sometimes Luke's formulation. Uh, you could maybe imagine doing that, but such synopsis didn't exist. They don't exist actually until the time of Eusebius in the early fourth century. Um, uh, and, uh, uh, and for the Septuagint, uh, Origen comes up with something like that for the Greek version of the of the Hebrew Bible, but um, you simply don't have that kind of tool that would allow you to do that. And uh, moreover, if we look at authors who do have to, who we know have two sources in front of them, uh, you don't find what's called microcompilation. That is where you take a word here and a word here 
um, you don't find that. You do find um, a kind of uh, movement between one block of text and another block of texts. So Alan Kirk, a few years ago, had a book called uh, Q in Matthew, where he, where he looked at uh, gnomic collections, that is, long collections of sayings, where we know what the vector, we know which is earlier, which is later, we know who uses who. And so then he was able to basically track how the, the posterior author was able to use prior collections uh, and uh, not conflating at the level of the sentence, but, but conflating at the level of the paragraph or zigzagging between paragraphs. Um, so that, that's really a question about how ancient authors actually operated and how they were able to operate in conflation. And that's been one of the real challenges for the Griesbach hypothesis, not that theoretically it's possible to conflate Mark, uh, to conflate the other two, but that the, the uh, tools that you would need to do the conflation simply didn't exist. Uh, and we can't find anybody else in the ancient world doing that kind of thing. So that, I think, makes the Griesbach hypothesis uh, less likely than a, a kind of mark and a priority hypothesis. Mm -hmm. But the other issue that you raise is multiple copies of Mark. And that's really a different sort of, I think that's a different question. Um, and th that, uh, the idea that there may have been a, a, either an, uh, an or Marcus, an, or, or early, an early Mark, which, um, uh, which either Matthew and or Luke used, or a later Mark, um, that is posterior to the, to the copies that Matthew and Luke used. That is, that is a, that's a theory that still has some legs. Uh, and it comes about largely because of this phenomenon called the, the minor agreements between Matthew and Luke, where, um, what you, what you ought to expect on a kind of clean version of the two document hypothesis is that when Matthew changes Mark, he will never change it in the same way that Luke changed it. Uh, when he, when Matthew eliminates a text from Mark or adds a text to Mark you're at, at a certain point, Luke is not going to be doing the same thing because that implies either some collaboration or something like that. And you shouldn't expect that mm. on the two document hypothesis. So one of the, uh, one of the solutions to that problem of the minor agreements uh, was proposed by a German scholar named Andreas Enolat, who looked at the minor agreements and he noticed that most of them seem to be post Markan. That is, the minor agreements seem to be developments of what Mark actually has. And so he posited that there actually is uh, a, a second, uh, uh, that, that Matthew and Luke are using uh, a post Markan text uh, and therefore the minor agreements are actually them copying this subsequent development of mark um, and that's why you end up with these these few agreements like prophesy who struck you which uh, is in both of Mar matthew and luke's uh, arrest scene um, uh, but isn't in mark um, so it's basically that somehow or other in, in some way or other Mark had already been subject to a kind of expansion or development, and Matthew and Luke are using that. That you can turn it around and, and uh, perhaps and argue that Matthew and Luke are using an earlier copy of Mark. Um, uh, I may say, or a later copy of Mark. Um, mm -hmm. But uh, I mean, it can it can be run both ways. But the, this notion of a either a, uh, an early copy of Mark or a secondary copy of Mark. Uh, is one way of answering this problem of the minor agreements. Uh, uh, I, you know, again, I'd say at least in general that it seems to me completely unlikely that Matthew and Luke are using the same copy of Mark. I mean, how would you account for that? And, you know, Matthew in Syria somewhere, Luke somewhere else. They surely haven't, you know, called up interlibrary loan and, you know, <laughs> and asked for the, you know, the original of Mark to use to edit. So at the very least, they're using copies of Mark which already has introduced 
uh, some changes, scribal changes of, you know, a adding, subtracting various kinds of details, changing grammar around. So there's, there's going to be some, uh, I would call this kind of noise in the system that you can't filter out. Uh, mm. because of multiple copies of Q and multiple copies of Mark. So it's, you know, it's, uh, you know, I guess it's the same kind of problem that you, you know, run into when you're editing audio, uh, you know, audio tapes that you have to eliminate the noise. And in the case of the synoptic problems, the noise is there and I don't <laughs> think you can filter it out. One of the, because one of the things that I thought I thought was interesting is, is when you look at Matthew and Luke's story about the blind man at Jericho, they both agree against Mark by omitting the guy's name. Or yeah, yeah. Mark says Bartimaeus, Matthew yeah. and Luke don't. And I'm like, well, if there's a proto-Mark, maybe in the original proto-Mark it didn't have that and, name. Yeah, that, that would be exactly kind of in, in Alwood's yeah. uh, theory that he gets a name, uh, but he gets the name too late for Matthew and Luke to... to uh, to get the name. It. Yeah. yeah. Um, uh, that actually could be a way of dealing with the Abiathar problem too, because both mm -hmm. Matthew and Luke eliminate it. And you may, it, you might say, well, there's been a, a, a Mark II uh, version that has added that name and it made a mistake in adding the name. Uh, mm -hmm. So it's not a matter of Matthew and Luke eliminating a mistake. It's Matthew and Luke seeing a copy of Mark that never had that mistake there. That would be a way of handling that problem. Mm -hmm. uh, the, I mean, one of the things that I that I've said in uh, in my book Excavating Q is I've got a section on minor agreements is that the problem of minor agreements is that we've got too many ways of accounting for them and we don't know which one to choose. Uh, uh, so it's one of these problems that I think will never be solved because there's there's too many factors that could potentially explain the data set that we've got and we have no idea of of which factors are the are the key ones? Is it possible that what could explain the zigzag, the zigzagginess or alleged zigzagging in, in Mark and proto Mark, I suppose, is that maybe one or both of them had knowledge of M and L uh, of Matthew and Luke's other sources, and that when they're looking at these different passion narratives, like they're incorporating some from M that I guess we can call Proto Matthew and L from Proto being Proto Luke. And they're not as sophisticated as Matthew and Luke, but they're they're somewhat similar. And that's how Mark ends up with Matthean wording or Matthean Mark and uh, overlap and then in other cases Luke Mark and wording overlap. Yeah, if yeah, when you get other sources that have a kind of gravitational pull on the on the editor, mm -hmm. um, then uh, that that may be one one way of explaining some, you know, some of these textual deviations. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, I think as a gen as a general explanatory principle, we ought to aim at uh, explaining the data with the fewest number of uh, of hypotheticals possible. You know that we actually have to posit in order to make an exp explanation work. And the more extras that you posit, from a logical point of view, at the same level of complexity, the, the, the larger number of other hypotheticals start to exist. So the, the simplicity, relative simplicity of the two document hypothesis or the FAR hypothesis doesn't, doesn't posit any other extra things, uh, which may have existed. Uh, but the second you start to posit you know, an M that has a kind of gravitational pull on Matthew against Mark or, or, or that Mark knows it, um, then, uh, it, then the sort of, you know, the field is open. You can start to posit all sorts of other things. Mm -hmm. uh, and, uh, and then it becomes hopeless uh, to, to, uh, to come up with any kind of uh, uh, plausible and workable uh, <coughs> hypothesis. And, the uh, this may um, uh, this may trouble some people if I put it this way, but uh, you know, in explanatory theories, we we try to shave with Occam's razor. That is, uh, causes are not to be multiplied without necessity. Um, so, if you can get away with explaining most of the problems most of the time with the simplest kinds of solutions, you stay with them because they have a certain kind of explanatory power. Mm 
Um, and as soon as you start introducing other causae, other, other, other causes, then you're actually making it, you're making your own job way more difficult because mm -hmm. you've just introduced the possibility of just as many other unknown variables into your solution, you know, and you know, at a certain point you, then you lose all possibility of saying anything that's, uh, that's useful. And part of the, the, uh, the beauty of both the two document hypotheses and in another way, the far, the far hypothesis is that they do work as explanations more or less. I think two document works better, mm -hmm. uh, to explain the data. Uh, but, uh, you know, when you get to say, you mentioned Boimard, who's got multiple intermediate documents. He's got a proto Luke. He's got a proto Matthew. Oh, he's yeah. got proto Mark. He's got John connected in there. Mm -hmm. And as soon as, you know, all of a sudden your table gets filled with so many unknowns that, uh, on one hand, you can explain everything because you can posit an unknown to explain this data or this, this datum or that datum. Uh, but you can also never know whether you're right. And you end up with a solution that I think is, becomes unworkable. Mm -hmm. um, uh, um, so, um, you know, there's a saying in Italian, even if it's not true, it's beautiful. And the two document hypothesis, and in a way, the far hypothesis may not be true, but they are beautiful. And that is, they work. Uh, they make sense of documents in a way that we find pleasing. Uh, I think we do have to say, in reality, it was never as simple as either of those two hypotheses project. Hmm. But we'll never know how complicated they were because we've got absolutely no way of getting to it. And in my closing question, as you've said earlier, Matthew and Luke did not literally use the same copy of Mark. Do you think that each copy, each copy of Mark that they used respectively uh, may have been a little different? Maybe different enough that it caught may it may explain at least some of the variations. Yeah, in yeah. I mean, just as you suggested, mm -hmm. you know, perhaps uh, the the some copies of Mark uh, had uh, uh, Bartimaeus's name in it, and some didn't. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, the one that that actually becomes our Mark is the one that has the name, and both Matthew and Luke's copies didn't have it. Uh, so that's certainly. Uh, and and one could explain some some of the Matthew Luca disagreements against Mark uh, by saying, well, they're both using they're both using a Mark here, but it's a different Mark than we have, and it's a different Mark than the other one has. And you can make the same suggestion as far as Q is concerned. So uh, I I do think that that we have to keep pretty firmly in mind that they're they're all using scribal copies, and scribal copies will always have scribal variations in them. Mistakes, variations, different choices, uh, uh, unreadable spots. Uh, you know, papyri are not terribly durable, and so you they blot out ink blots out pretty easy. There's all sorts of things that can go wrong with your copy of Mark or your copy of Q that is going to partly account for why Luke uh, or Matthew end up with a different version than than is on the text that you've got. So, I, I think that really has to be kept clearly in mind. Uh, we, that is, we sort of have to think our way out of a print culture or a Xerox culture hmm. where, uh, you know, ideally your, your copies are exactly what the predecessor uh, also said. Uh, that's what we want with a Xerox machine and, and you want it with printing. But that, that kind of exactitude just doesn't, couldn't, it couldn't exist in the ancient world. And even after Matthew and Luke were being was being written was already written down, that the longer ending of Mark was added mm -hmm. a few yeah. more verses. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And yeah, so a scribe looks at Mark's uh, Mark's ending and says that there must be more than that that yeah. happened. And so you get both the shorter ending of Mark and the longer ending of Mark eventually added. And uh, uh, so <clears throat> yeah, that's uh, yeah. So um, even the the copyists after Mark is sort of finished. If there's such a thing, they're they're manipulating Mark in various ways, and Matthew and Luke. So I'm gonna add one more part to my question. Does it look like to you that the longer ending of Mark it was was added in order to a, a kind of in response to Matthew and Luke's more elaborate resurrection narratives? I think so. Mm -hmm. um, but I would say even if you, even if scribes didn't know Matthew's Matthew and Luke's ending. 
Mark's ending is so peculiar because, you know, Mark 14, 27 has Jesus uh, say, I go before you to Galilee mm -hmm. and there you will see me. But it doesn't happen. Uh, it ends with nothing happening because the women don't say anything to anybody because they were afraid. So there's a real narrative conflict, apparent conflict in at the end of Mark between 14 and 16 that, uh, as I say, even if the scribes of Mark hadn't seen Matthew and Luke, which I think they certainly had, um, they, they would come to Mark, you know, 16, uh, 8 and say, there has to be more than that. You know, there has to be something to actually finish the story because it's not finished. Right. Um, and the longer ending finishes it. So. Well, thank you for joining me today, John Cothenborg. Thank you. It's always a pleasure. Hello, viewers. Thanks for watching this video from the History Valley YouTube channel. Please don't forget to subscribe and hit the notification bell. And if any of you wish to further support this channel, please consider checking out this channel's Patreon page and becoming a patron. And or donate through PayPal or through Super Chat during your live stream. Thank you.